All right, this is going to be my attempt to give you the abridged history of Unitarian Universalism in an easily digestible bite. Suffice to say, it's going to be impossible to give you a comprehensive history of this really fascinating liberal religious tradition that has been around since really the beginning of Christianity. So I apologize in advance that I'm going to be missing a lot. And I'm going to try to focus on things that are relevant to who we are today. So we're going to do this in two parts. The first part focusing on Unitarianism and the second part focusing on Universalism. Because as you might know, Unitarianism and Universalism were both heretical theological positions within Christianity, which means that there were Unitarian Christians and Universalist Christians that were hanging out for centuries before they came together in 1961 to create the Unitarian Universalist Association, of which Foothills is a member. So this is going to be part one, history of Unitarianism. And I'm going to give myself five minutes to do this. I don't know if that's possible, but so Unitarian, the word comes actually from an insult. It was an insult that Orthodox Christians uh, hurled against certain Christians that they didn't believe were truly Christian. And the reason they didn't think they were Christian was because they believed that God was not contained in the Trinity, these three parts of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Because Unitarians, they believed that God was unitary, that there was just God. Now, that might seem like a really trivial debate, right? Some people think God has three persons. Other people think God only has one. Um, for most of us, it's not going to change the average day. But actually, when you think about the shifts, it's actually quite huge. So we're going to begin our story with the Puritans. This was this really radical, um, conservative, political and religious movement that came out of the United Kingdom. They um, left the UK to come and colonize what would become North America, establishing the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1628. As soon as this started, they practiced a very radical form of Christianity based in the teachings of a man named John Calvin. Essentially, one of their beliefs was in predestination, that we as humans were entirely wicked and entirely unable to save ourselves from anything or to do good without God's help. And in fact, God chose before we were even born or before history began, whether or not we'd be saved or not. We had we had nothing to do with it, and we couldn't have anything to do with it. And so in that Puritan world, you can imagine that there wasn't a lot of focus on humans' capacity to discern good or make choices, because guess what? God's already chosen that. Now, that theology started to create some friction. And in Boston in the 1730s, there started to become some liberal clergy that actually believed that we had the capacity to choose. And they rooted their belief based in a new reading of scripture. They started to read the Bible not as the literal word of God, but in fact, the story of the people who actually wrote it. So they went to the original languages to understand what did the people who wrote this text actually mean? And when they looked at the parts that talked about the Trinity, they realized that it didn't support the doctrine. And so they believed that the Trinity wasn't a true, true, authentic Christian belief. And that sort of changed everything because initially Jesus was part of the Trinity. That means that Jesus was holy God and holy human. And for these early Unitarians, they suddenly took Jesus out of the Trinity. Now, at first he was just like the almost God. I mean, he was like so close to God. He had all this special revelation. He was like the best human ever, um, but he was, you know, unattainable for most of us. But then the next generation of Unitarians came around and they said, well, we think Jesus was a great prophet a great teacher, but he's one of many. These Unitarians or these early Unitarians were starting to read world religions. They were reading the Hindu Vedas and the Quran, and they were reading the teachings of Buddha, and they were thinking, huh, there's a lot of great leaders and great teachers around. Why would Jesus have a unique revelation? Now, that slide from one generation to the next, you can imagine where it was going because the transcendentalists came around after that and they said, hey, stop. We think that everyone 
with the right cultivation, can have the same relationship that Jesus had to God, which is this direct connection to truth, we think everyone can have that, democratizing that experience of God. Now, that was deeply controversial, of course, at the time. But what essentially that secured for Unitarian Universalists was this conception that we, that Jesus becoming human, endowed us with that same power to connect to God, to know the truth, to build and to, tr and to trust our own senses and our own experience as valid. Now, as Unitarians moved from the 19th into the 20th century, we started to say, you know, and actually we don't think we need God or Jesus to be mandatory for us to discern the truth. In fact, we can have people who are atheists or Buddhists or agnostics all in the same place. It doesn't, we need, don't need to mandate God. So Unitarianism has always, as kind of their primary heresy, was to lift up humans' faculty to, to, to discern truth and to act as moral agents. The Puritans said we didn't have that capacity, and each time we moved Jesus, and my timer's up, but I'm going to keep going, each time we moved him closer, or closer to us and away from being out of reach, uh, of humanity, of uh, being too closely associated with God. What it did is it endowed human, be, the human being with that faculty to discern truth and to be moral agents in the world. And so there's a lot more I could talk about in Unitarianism, but that's a short five minutes on the history of Unitarianism.